From the European Parliament here in Brussels, this is Raw Politics. Thank you for joining us tonight and this is what we have coming up for you. March banned. Warsaw calls of a Poland Independence Day march organized by ultra-nationalists. Macron misstep. The criticism mounts after the French president planned to honor a war hero turned Nazi collaborator. Weber rules. We chat with newly crowned EPP candidate for Commissioner President Manfred Weber in Helsinki. That's ageist. A Dutch pensioner sues the government for his right to be 20 years younger. And testy Trump. The U.S. president cracks down on a White House correspondent in tonight's Raw Moment. All right, it is time to meet our panel for tonight. We have Maeve McMahon. She is our Brussels correspondent at Euronews. Maeve, which of these stories are you watching closely? Well, I've been watching Helsinki for the last two days and the appointment of Manfred Weber. I'm not sure he's going to strike a chord uh, with Europeans beyond really the bubble. That's interesting to look at. We, we have been looking at this uh, story for the past two days. All right, joining us as well is Mitta Grohlman. She is a communications consultant and political strategist at Fleischmann Hillard, specializing in policy and reputation issues. Which one are you looking at closely? Well, the man you can always watch, Macron, and his comments about General Petain. Mm. Yeah, that one is an interesting conversation indeed that we're going to be having. And we have Bogoslav Liberatsky, a Polish MEP with the Socialist and Democrats Group and Vice President of the European Parliament. Which one are you watching closely tonight? It's quite easy to guess. <laughs> it is Freedom March, uh, March ban in Warsaw. Absolutely. That's my focus today. Fun. And that is actually where we are going to begin our program tonight. Because this Sunday, as world leaders gather to mark 100 years since the end of the First World War, Poland will be celebrating a century of independence and confronting old tensions not left in the past. Now, far-right groups are fighting to participate in the celebrations after Warsaw's mayor cancelled their march, citing security concerns. Now, last year, 60,000 people attended an independence march organized Organized by nationalists, some participants chanting calls for a, quote, white Europe and carrying racist, anti-Semitic and Islamophobic banners. Now, the march attracted worldwide media attention. Poland's president has now planned a separate so-called inclusive march, but some members of the country's ruling Law and Justice Party are pushing back, including Secretary of State uh, Jacek Sashin. To jest ograniczenie prawa do zgromadzenia, no bo można reagować i trzeba reagować w sytuacji, kiedy łamane jest prawo w trakcie manifestacji, ale nie można w ten sposób prewencyjnie ograniczać prawa obywateli do swobodnego manifestowania. No to się nie mieści w granicach demokratycznych. All right, well, let's uh, talk about uh, this. Uh, sorry, you were, you were watching it very, very closely. Can you tell us what is going on exactly in Poland? This is a good question. What is going on? It was proclaimed March. This March to celebrate 100th anniversary, but it is traditional every year, 11th of November, such a march used to take place in Warsaw. So learning from the past, quite often it was march as used as an occasion to demonstrate very right character. So according to our constitution, and Mr. Sashin is quite right, there is freedom of speech, freedom of demonstration, freedom of using all tools which are allowed, for instance, such a march, to express conviction. However, red, line, red lines should be established, so they cannot cross a given limits. And from this point of view, I am very sorry that it is banning took place. But there is also another part of our side of this coin. Yeah. Mayor of Warsaw, big city, having in mind what had place years ago, every year, at least 10 years ago, it's a long, quite long history. What we could see in this video at the beginning, it means it was a question about safety and security. Mm. She was just, I mean, mayor was quite right asking, what about safety and security? But she was not only asking, but answering, well, I ban the march. And this is quite a good and point for saying it was not so easy, simple situation. Sure, and there's also that issue of um, not wanting a repeat of last year. And there was a lot of focus on Poland, on, on the, uh, the neo-Nazi, the racist slogans being, being portrayed. Is, is this also a question of not wanting to, to portray Poland in, in a certain light, image, a reputation? Well, I would say so. I, 
there's been a lot of debate both around Poland, in Poland, about Poland, uh, and and it's probably it's not feeding into a sort of a positive image about Poland, and I, I think it's unhelpful for for the country. Uh, in general, and it probably was one of the concerns as well. And let's not forget, the country is also gearing up for elections. Mm. So it's all part of that as well, obviously. So there is a conscious effort not to not to do that. Maybe there's a security aspect of it, but you also think that there is that there's an image and reputation aspect of it. Yeah, I absolutely Well, just on the security that, um, yeah. aspect of it, I, a couple of weeks ago, I covered the lesbian and gay and bisexual and transgender mm-hmm. conference that was taking place here in Brussels, and I met up with a lot of um, activists who who live in Warsaw, and they said when protests like this take place. They have to barricade their offices because otherwise mm. they will be attacked. And the amounts of people who are under attack, even in the city of Warsaw, just because they're a little bit different, especially uh, when protests like this take place, uh, is extremely alarming. It's alarming, but uh, take a look. This margin is quite narrow in Poland, with extreme right parties, nationalists. Is it always just extreme right who go through this? They are I mean, visible is... and noisy, and they are taking this opportunity to to be granted what visibility. What about people who are not extreme, that just want to be celebrating or, or commemorating? Uh, oh, you see, this is exactly the question. Mm. Because 100th anniversary of regaining our freedom after 123 years of being in, I may say, in slavery, <laughs> divided between three neighbors, it's a good occasion to say, take a look, we recovered, we are united, one country, we have our good position being member of the European Union, being member of NATO, we could be proud that mm. everything, I mean, these big geograph- uh, political changes has started in Poland. After Polish changes, free election round table, three, years, three months later, Berlin Wall collapsed. A year later, Soviet Union disappeared. So this is good occasion stress. We should go together. Because it's a But it's being hijacked, you're saying, by other... Political. Yes, you are right. It has been ja- hijacked by these extreme rights. Mm-hmm. And right now we are waiting for court decision. This, the court decision should be made today, 6.30 p.m., right. whether this march it will be allowed or not. And as somebody who Just works quickly, in the media, yeah. it will be the images, of course, of the far-right protests and the eventual which violence, which will make it to the rest of the world, it absolutely. But what, what will be interesting to know is exactly, you know, wh- how this is being being received, and, and especially by, by Polish voices. Uh, our, key, our team in the Cube, uh, Alex Morgan, and our team in Lyon are looking at this. The Polish voices, what do they really think of this debate? Alex? Tessa and team, hello. As you've been saying there, look how divisive a topic this really is, banning this march. Well, very, very quickly, the organiser of the march on his Twitter account tweeted this to say the march will go ahead, announcing a legal appeal, which you're discussing there, obviously uh, fighting it. He's live tweeting about the updates and the timings, but very quickly saying this will happen. We will challenge this decision. You'd expect that from the organiser of the march. But I think what is interesting is the number of liberal voices in Poland and elsewhere who specialise in studying Poland have really jumped on this uh, about against the ban, if you like, cause. Let's just uh, pull up what Stanley Bill, he's a lecturer at Cambridge University on Polish politics, and he says, well, the standout thing for him is the number of liberal Polish voices pointing out that this ban goes too far. One of those voices he quotes is uh, Paul here, and uh, Paul, just to bring you a translation here, he sort of says that uh, liberal democracy means that you've got to uh, endure the voices of those you do not appreciate. And that's echoed as well by uh, Marcin here, who says, even those we like the least, they have civil rights. And in this tweet here, he's saying, obviously, those civil rights mean they should be allowed to march. So you can see, it's not just the the organisers of the march you'd expect this from, but actually liberal voices in Poland going, hang on, that's a bit much. Also, uh, Stanley Bill, uh, the the lecture I started with there, pointing out a bit of a political motivation or a hint at a political motivation in some tweets. There's also that side of this discussion. But... Let's bring you the other side. It's obviously uh, clear that there are some people who feel very, very strongly. Uh, Tom Junes, who has written about Polish dissent and politics in Poland, well, he says, of course, this latest decision is politically motivated, he says, but it should have been, it's been a long time coming, in his words. He goes on to say, uh, especially since this event has been taking place in a city that has suffered so much from the consequences of hate speech. So, 
praising the ban, although admittedly questioning why it came to pass. And actually, before the ban was announced, there are people like Helena. She's an academic. She divides her time between Warsaw, London, and New York. Well, she tweeted this, a petition which, um, if you click through the link, it actually says about getting rid of fascism from the streets of Poland. This was obviously before the ban was announced. She was calling on people to sign it, to have the march banned uh, beforehand, to pile pressure on the politicians. So you can see, Tessa, how... There are those obviously on the, the liberal left who say, yes, this must go. It's, it's prompting hate speech. But there's also those on the left in Poland, the liberals saying, no, you can't be banning this march. So it's not just divided right from left, it's divided left from left. It is a divisive uh, topic. So regardless of the motives for the ban, you can certainly see why it's got a lot of people talking. Indeed it has. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Alex Morgan. And also because if you look at the images that we saw, they are very powerful and quite scary images uh, that we have seen. Uh, do you think there's a disproportionate focus on the images that we see like that and, 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 and consequently how it, Poland is portrayed? Well, I, I think there's a disproportionate show of those images, but I think it's completely natural. It happens not only in Poland, it happens wherever these marches takes place. I just think that given the political situations and the other issues that has been going on in Poland, this gets even more enhanced and more attention uh, and draw more negative attention to Poland. And I think that's the damaging part of it. Mm. All right. And also, the, 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 is this a right way of dealing with nationalist groups? I mean, the European Parliament well, passed a resolution, right? They so didn't do, uh, indeed. And the whole problem is indeed how to, how to control or how to make sure that these protests remain peaceful. Um, and it was just a couple of weeks ago, in fact, wasn't there a resolution backed here in the European Parliament where um, over 300 MEPs called for a ban on these neo-fascist groups in light of, of course, back on the 22nd of July 2011 when Anders Breivin Breivik um, killed over 70 people right. um, in, a, in an island in Norway. I mean, the question is, is that, is that the right way to go about controlling it? So, go, you know, so, you know, yep. there it is. All right. We will uh, move on now to the next story that we're looking at today because French President Emmanuel Macron has been facing a growing backlash. First over plans to honor a controversial war hero this weekend and now over his defense of the decision. Let's take a look. Je n'occulte aucune page de l'histoire. Et Maréchal Pétain a été pendant la Première Guerre mondiale aussi un grand soldat. Voilà. On peut avoir été un grand soldat à la Première Guerre mondiale et avoir conduit à des choix funestes durant la Deuxième. This is a moment that sparked outrage. Emmanuel Macron justifying plans to commemorate Marshal Philippe Pétain during a ceremony Saturday marking 100 years since the end of the First World War. For some, General Pétain is a national hero. He helped win the First World War after he led the French army to victory in Verdun. But in World War II, as head of the Vichy regime, he collaborated with Nazi Germany. The proceedings of the Pétain trial have drawn out into weeks. And he was convicted of treason. Despite mounting criticism, Macron stood firm in his defense. Il ne faut pas créer des fausses polémiques et vouloir diviser les Français. Maintenant, je sais bien qu'il y en a qui cherchent des polémiques tous les jours. Mais moi, j'ai essayé de dire un peu de la vérité de notre pays. Well, yeah, just an update to that story so that uh, homage to Pétain has been cancelled. And I think, so the spokesman uh, of Macron had said that it was, there was confusion. That they, were, they weren't conf sufficiently clear on that point. Now, is this too little too late now that the homage has been cancelled? Is it too little too late? The damage has been done? Well, the damage has been done. I, I think it's, it's also a story that sort of divides Europe. If you look at it with European eyes, it's a story that everyone in one way or another can relate to. So it might be a French story for Macron, but it's certainly a story that, that my country and every other country can relate to. And therefore, it's probably blown out a little bit more in the European press as well. Mm. And obviously, the damage is done. And, and Macron knows himself that that, that was a communication blur. Mm, it was a faux pas. I mean, it was what, what was he thinking, you think, at What at was he point? thinking? I mean, Macron, <laughs> when he came to power, he seemed so slick and so controlled, but yet he's made so many faux pas, so many blunders, when as head of state like that, you need to be very careful of what you say and who you insult and who you hurt, and especially when you talk about history. And here he's really upset the Jewish community, which are often under attack um, in France, and often um, Jewish areas need to be protected from the threat of terrorism, so it's an area that he has been highly focused on. So he, he shouldn't make silly, silly mistakes like this. Was it, though, because he defended, yeah, you know, he defended uh, his initial decision, but although now that they're not, they've cancelled it, uh, as a politician, I mean, does this happen? 
You see, every country has a little bit different history and a little bit mm. different, um, let's say, even attitude. For instance, for me as a Pole, the situation right now is quite convenient. Why? Because for us, it's never to be accepted that you may collaborate with your enemy, with mm. somebody who invaded your country, mm. under whom you are occup occupied by whom. And never in Poland, it was a history that any institution collaborated with Nazi Germans during the Second World War. Our opinion was that it's a matter of honor, dignity, to fight against, never doing anything together. Mm. However, we should take a look that it is French dilemma, because Pétain, during the First World War, yeah. he was somebody different. Then, but take a look into results. After the Second World War, Paris was exactly the same as before. Warsaw was sure. in 85% in total ruins. However, it's quite so easier sometimes too. to restore the city sure. than to restore dignity. It's at least Polish point of view. I mean, Ma Macron's comments really got a lot of criticism. He did get a lot of criticism for that. All right, moving on to another story. Uh, UK Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt, he was speaking in Paris today, and he quashed any rumors of an imminent Brexit deal. But he said that he was confident one would be pushed through Parliament. He also touched on the Irish border question. The UK government and the Irish government want is the same, which is that we create a structure, a guarantee that we're not going to return back to the troubles that we've had in Northern Ireland. And that is in both countries' strong interests. Now, how we get there is, is incredibly complicated, but the objective is the Maeve. same. Well, Maeve, you were recently at the border. You were talking to people who were directly impacted by what's going on here. Tell us uh, what Absolutely. that was like. Absolutely. Just this Monday, in fact, I visited a couple of villages and towns uh, along the border, like Castle Blaney, Monaghan, uh, Carrick, Macross, and they're all deeply upset and concerned, and especially because they're hearing about their livelihoods and their daily lives being at stake and being discussed mm -hmm. on a daily basis by politicians, mostly in London and Brussels. But they say... Nobody has come to consult them. They were asking me what's going on. They have absolutely no idea. Let's take a little look at uh, this report. This is Castle Blaney, a sleepy town near the Irish border where fears about Brexit are the talk of the town. We head off to meet a well-known businessman who grew up on the border and is keeping an eye on the talks. Oh, well, I, I, I would say they would put spot checks, you know, mm. that they wouldn't be back to the smuggling again. Do you know... You would have to that, you know, because you could rig up your own computer to suit yourself. <laughs> England was wrong to to leave. They shouldn't have left. Like, you know, there was a shabby businessman in the country, he'll tell you that. Why? What exactly would a hard border mean for business? Well, it's going to mean, obviously, less work. It's going to mean less employment. It's going to mean less money in the local economy. And that's going, to, and that's going to have an impact on the town. You know, there's talk of a hard border. I don't know really what this backstop means. The CEO of CombiLift has no idea either. None of us have any more clarity today than we had the day of the vote. And that's really uncertainty. It's not good for business. And it's not good for personal lives that live, particularly that live in this border counties. It's the same challenge for this transport company. If a hard border does go up, we have a number of our workers who would have to cross the border four different times just to get to work, you know, and then home again in the evening. So it, it, it is absolutely ridiculous. So good. There are about 275 border crossings, about 250 look like this one. Locals are worried about a return of economic woes that could bring back violence to the region. Anything uh, that would interfere with the peace and comfort that we've had since the Good Friday Agreement for the last 20 years, it would be a tragedy. While locals await more certainty, a new poll says the Irish border is low on UK voters' Brexit concerns. All right, well, watching that, Maeve, the general feeling I got is that the mood is not very positive. I mean, what, what, what was it like? Was it resignation? Was it fear? What, the mood confusion? is as di dismal and right. bleak as the weather was on Monday as I was there. People were really, really upset because I went in to talk to them in coffee shops, in the bank, in the supermarket, and even down the pub. And it was all people are talking about because they've lived, obviously, through the troubles. Uh, and they've seen uh, what it's like. And since the Good Friday Agreement was put in place um, and the last customs check was taken up, 
life has gradually got back to got back to normal. And, and a lot of the people I spoke to in that clip, they said their kids now play play with each other on both sides of the border, and they just really don't want to revisit uh, the past. They want to move forward. And as what they told me as well, as things are fine the way they are with the UK being in the single market and being in the customs union. I mean, I think it's elements like these that is, that's missing from discussions. When we talk about in Brussels, we talk talk about Ireland as a sticking point. It's the last mm -hmm. bit of, of the missing piece of the puzzle in the Brexit negotiation. And we, when we see that, it's putting a face yes. to this, this actual problem. Yeah. But I, I think that the IOEs and the UK it does not sort of not know that. They know that. I think it's just a very difficult conversation. And obviously you have it among the EU 27 and they, they're not there. The, the Scandinavians are not in, in Ireland and haven't lived that history. And of course it's difficult. It's extremely difficult. And it comes down to political principles instead of human lives, which it should be about. And, and I, I think crossing that sort of dilemma of, of sort of one or the other has become so black-white from a, from a UK side and from an EU27 side. And I don't think it's that black-white. We need to find some sort of blur for this to move forward mm -hmm. because otherwise it's going to be incredibly difficult to live on. Yeah, and we hear of the, of the, um, the view from the UK. We hear of the view from the main countries here. What about the view from Poland or from, from where you are? From our point of view, first of all, UK and government is to be blamed for because Brexit, you, you have kind of the laboratorium. How harmful is Brexit, not only for EU as a whole, but especially for United Kingdom. But second, what's important, it's a matter of practical solutions. Right now, I have a feeling that government of UK is playing kind of a game, how to win because of Brexit. And in my opinion, Michel Barnier's approach and European Commission approach is more practical, more in favor of citizens saying you should not come back to these divisions of Ireland. I think that's not the view completely from the UK. I mean, they would, they would throw the ball back at the EU saying, well, the UK has offered much more than the EU has at this point. Yes, yes, yes. But as long as this island is treated as a ball to mm. be kicked from one corner to another corner, mm. it means this, uh, this lack of stability. It also is a feeling that something is jeopard in jeopardy. It's a very dangerous situation. Mm. And I don't wish to come back to a situation until everything got back to normal. Absolutely. And just briefly, I mean, what was okay. very ironic is what um, most people who voted, well, most MEPs who were against the European Union is because of the bureaucracy and the paperwork. Yes. Mm. But actually, most people I worked to there, in, I spoke to there in the factories and in the business said that actually it would bring much more layers of bureaucracy, much more red tape, and it would bring along much more delays with wow. practical I think people they work with every day. And certainly overall on this issue, we're waiting to find out. It's crunch time. Anyway, we will find out what happens with Brexit. All right, coming up for On Raw Politics, we take a look at the fleet war cooking between the EU and Colombia. Plus, if we chat with Manfred Weber, the man representing the European People's Party, to become the next Commission President, hear what he has to say about the upcoming elections and Viktor Orban. That's after the break. Welcome back to Raw Politics. Now, the European People's Party has chosen its contender to be the next European Commission president. Many were unsurprised to hear that they picked their leader, Bavarian MEP with the Christian Social Union, Manfred Weber. Weber and his outsider opponent, former Finnish Prime Minister Alexander Stubb, held a debate which was criticized for its lack of, well, debate. The biggest bone of contention in the EPP ranks is membership of Hungary's populist leader, Viktor Orban. But that issue was conspicuously not on the agenda. Well, Manfred Weber had a victory speech at the EPP conference this afternoon. Let's take a look. The Spitzen candidate for the European elections for the European People's Party for 2009 with 492 votes will be Manfred Weber. Let's use this momentum of Helsinki. Let's go back home to our cities, to our villages. Let's tell people that we have a good idea for the future of this continent. Let's fight, let's argue, let's convince, and then we will win in May 2019. Right, our, our political editor, Darren McCaffrey, has been covering the EPP conference this week, and he's joining us now from Helsinki. Darren, you're in the middle of the action there. Well, it wasn't surprising, was it? <laughs> 
It really wasn't, uh, Tess. Uh, it was uh, pretty expected results uh, when we got it uh, this afternoon that Manfred Weber had indeed uh, won. A pretty emphatic victory as well, getting, what, 80% of the votes, uh, four out of every five EPP uh, delegates that gathered here in uh, Helsinki. And ultimately, you know, he is the person now that could potentially go on to replace uh, Jean-Claude Juncker uh, next year, depending, of course, on the result of the election and, indeed, what the EU national leaders uh, decide. But it is very much a focus on security, on the Christian heritage to a degree of uh, Europe, and this idea that Turkey shouldn't accede to the EU uh, that I think won over those voters. Well, at least that was the question that I asked uh, Manfred Weber, the Bavarian politician, the man that must be said is little known outside of the European Parliament at the moment about what does he think won over so many EPP delegates. Let's have a watch. Well, it's, it was my offer which was obviously successful. I said to the delegates, uh, I'm a true Christian Democrat. I believe in the values of my party, of my movement. I want to be a bridge builder in Europe. You have to keep Europe together. And I said, uh, we have to practice democracy. That's a fundamental thing for reconnecting Brussels, European level, to the citizens in the European Union. That is my offer, and it worked. And I'm very happy about this, because it gives me a credible and a strong mandate for the next month to lead the strongest, the largest political family in Europe uh, into the elections. Uh, you talked about the Christian heritage um, of Europe, and you talked about churches. Isn't it a bit outdated? Because you're right, there are churches in every village and town in Europe, but there are fewer and fewer people going into them. Well, uh, to, have, uh, to have a religion is a private issue. No statesman, no politician should ever talk about this. Well, why why I, did you mention it in your speech then? Well, I presented myself. I presented myself. and That is part of me, and I'm proud of this, so I have no problem to hide this. Uh, the fundamental question is for us as Christian Democrats, again, that is... Let me say this, that is the fundament of my whole movement. We, we are, since the beginning, of, since the Second World War, we are Christian Democrats. We call ourselves so. So I will not hide this. I, that's, that's my basic uh, principle. The key question for us is, what does it mean in today, today's modern life? And I give you an example for me. Pope Francis, when he stood in Lampedusa, and when he was in front of the Mediterranean Sea, and said as a, as a Pope, as a Catholic Pope, uh, don't forget the migrants, they are human beings, you should respect the dignity. That is a modern approach of Christian identity. So to show respect to every human person, wherever he's from or she's from. And again, it's a question, what does this mean, Christian identity? And I would say we should identify it and, uh, and describe it in a very modern way. Uh, and just finally, people would say that this is also a victory for Viktor Orban. Are you going to be soft on Viktor Orban because he supported you? Well, I'm one of the personalities who is not only necessary to talk about Viktor Orban, I had the need to vote on this, and I voted for Article 7. So the nuclear option to fight for rule of law, to fight for our fundamental principles, was activated because I and a lot of colleagues in the EPP voted in favor of this option. So for us there is no special treatment on fundamental principles inside of the EPP or outside of the EPP. And I would ask also for the future to have a binding, strong, also with sanction, a strong rule of law mechanism in the future. We have to find a mechanism to guarantee to the Europeans that our basic principles are respected by everybody. So you can count on us. The EPP will never give up on the fundamental principles and we will implement them. Great. Thank you. Well, Tessa, um, just like uh, Europe, I suppose the EPP is uh, divided on many issues as well, not least this issue of uh, Hungary. Many in the party want to see uh, them take a stronger line, considering that Viktor Orban, of course, and his party are part of the EPP family, as they call it. We have to wait and see uh, whether that happens. It is an issue they're going to have to confront at some stage. What is also interesting, of course, is the Spritzen, get, Spritzen candidate process. Uh, ultimately, it is a process that started, what, only five years ago. It's very new. Uh, there are questions whether it will survive, whether actually Manfred Weber will end up, if the EPP remain the largest party, becoming the Commission President. There are suggestions that the EU Council, the people who will ultimately decide, the national leaders, uh, that they may choose someone else. And interestingly, there was one other senior EPP member here today, Tessa, Michel Barnier. He was on that stage, not talking about Brexit, but his vision for Europe. May he become the Commission President? Well, we'll have to wait and see. All be revealed, of course, uh, after the elections next summer.
an interesting move indeed. Thank you for that, uh, Darren McCaffrey there, talking to us from Helsinki. Now, with more uh, for analysis, joining me in the studio, we have Shandor Girosh, a reporter from our Hungarian service, political reporter Lily Bayer, and Yasenko Selimovic, a Swedish MEP from the Alde Group. All right, Yasenko, I'll, I'll start with you because, um, you know, we saw Manfred Weber there talking like he's a pacifist, he's inclusive, but he said he voted for Article 7. But at the end of the day, Article 7, uh, uh, pushing for rule of law in Hungary, it's the beginning of a really long process and nothing really can happen to Hungary at this point. Is it paying lip service? I mean, MEPs voted, so is it just paying lip service to Yes, this? it is. Yes, it is, of course. Uh, and uh, Viktor Orban will make a problem for EPP and for Mafra Weber's candidature as well. Uh, it will, he's quite vocal, he's um, loud, he's getting the attention, and everybody will connect Viktor Orban with EPP. And that will be a problem for the EPP further on. So they should have thrown him out for a long time ago. Uh, they, they, there are other parties in other groups as well, in my group, in other groups, there are parties that should have been thrown out, but they should have thrown out before the election because this will be a problem that will linger with them until the elections. You, you say should have been uh, thrown yeah. out already, even from your party. So, okay, before I, before I get into that, I want to ask why Viktor Orban uh, has such confidence uh, in, in sticking to his, to his line, in, in going against... Uh, uh, the, the rest of his party. I'll ask you, you're, you're Hungarian, you understand what, is in, what he's uh, thinking, maybe? Yeah, in Hungary, he's always playing for domestic audience in Hungary and he cannot be weak. He cannot be weaker than he was, for example, in September when he attacked uh, some of his colleagues at the European Parliament. Because in this policy, you can go only further, only being more aggressive. He always always needs an enemy to fight with, uh, whether it's the European Union, whether it's George Soros or the United Nations, doesn't matter, he needs to fight and always needs to take one step further. So if he makes uh, concessions, even small ones, uh, he can be portrayed as a weak person in Hungary and he's not going to make it. Is he playing smart though? He's trying to still stay within the EPP just enough and then, and then pandering to well, his uh, local audience. You know, EPP is uh, representing the biggest business groups in Europe. They mm. have uh, very good ties to the German car making industry. And uh, Orban is in very good uh, connection with them business also. Okay. So it's, first of all, business. Hungary wants to do business. EPP wants to do business. European Union is okay with that. Right. And uh, that's a very strong it's point. It's an interesting uh, angle. Now, Lily, is this a strategy, you think, that um, it's better to keep your, we say, enemies or the people that are making trouble, keep them close rather than pushing them away and, and, and then uh, maybe forming their own uh, alliances later on? Is this a strategy? I do think it's a strategy. Uh, Politico has done some polling recently, and our projection is that the EPP will take 180 seats out of 705 in the next election. 14 of these will belong to Fidesz. And if we also keep in mind that Fidesz has close Hungarian ethnic allies in Romania that will also get a few seats, that's actually a pretty sizable block. And the EPP will be facing fierce competition from populists like mm. Matteo Salvini in Italy. So I think there was a decision following very fierce debate within the EPP that for the party as a whole, um, it is better from the leadership's perspective, not from all the members' perspectives, but the leadership, and especially Joseph Dahl and Manfred Weber, they believe that it is better for the uh, party's chances if they keep people like Viktor Orban on their side. So you think they should but have if, been kicked out? If this was a strategy, then it was a bad strategy. <laughs> <laughs> let's, right. let's conclude it, because every political opponent will use every opportunity to point it out until the election and after the election. So they are losing on it. They should have thrown it out. They should have thrown him out, his party, Fidesz, out of the EPP, because he's, he's, he's not, not really, he's damaging the image of the EPP. But why do you and think it it's will too be late? That way. Why do you think it's too late? No, it's not too late. He, he mm. should have been thrown out yesterday. I, I mean, it, it could be, it could have been done, uh, it could be done in the future as well. But the, the, let me come to the next point. The problem with the Viktor Orban is actually that if they throw him out, he will not disappear. He will just join the, the next group. And the, the problem that is creating these groups, these populists, is not attacked. We are not fighting against the causes that creates populism. 
So, well, you can put him in another group, he'll be there, like mm. Matteo Salvini. But until we start fighting causes for that creates populism, nothing will change. But yes, he should have been thrown out of the EPP. It will be much easier for them to make election. It will be much easier to them to fight the election campaign. Is that what he wants? Uh, to be thrown out in the end? I'm not sure, to make because... A point? Uh, First of all, the EPP has a very strong uh, lobbying power. They can block sanctions against Hungary. Uh, still, there is a lot of EU money going to Hungary. Just imagine if uh, Fidesz would be thrown out and they would be the independent uh, MEPs. Then uh, the EU Commission could easily attack uh, Hungary with sanctions. Yeah. They could block some of the uh, cohesion funds as it is happening now also. And just imagine if Hungary would not be in the EPP in the last eight years, what would be the situation now? Probably there would be not any, uh, there would be less independent organizations. Right. Probably the court would be also under political pressure. So the EPP, I think, has a strategy of containing any, a little mean, bit in, Orban. I mean, in any case, we, the, the, the European elections this time will be really closely watched because it could potentially change the makeup of the, the next parliament, and that will be really interesting indeed. All right, well, after the break on raw politics, fresh from the US midterm elections, US President Donald Trump shows no sign of warming up to the media as the clashes with journalists, even booting one from the White House. Don't go away. Welcome back. Now, we all know age is just a number and you're as old as you feel. But for one Dutch pensioner, those expressions are cold comfort. 69-year-old Emil Rattelband has launched a legal battle against his local government, suing to be recognized as 20 years younger than his actual age. He argues that he faces age discrimination from potential employers and potential love interests on the dating application Tinder. Well, so he's fighting to legally change his birth date. And to talk about this, I'm back with Maeve McMahon, our Brussels correspondent, Politico reporter Lily Bayer, and MEP Yasenko Selimovic. All right, you, you were snickering when we when we talked about Tinder, but Tinder aside, is there a legal basis? Is, is there is there a point? He, does he have a point that we should be able to to lower our age if he wanted to legally? Well, he's testing a border. Where, where does these borders go now these days? And we actually are expanding them all the time. Now these days, you are. Possible, you can change the sex if you want to legally change it, and he wants legally to change it's age. Discrimination. So, so uh, we're going to come to the point until somebody says stop, stop, stop. This is not this is not fine any longer. But I mean, this is a good good battle. I, it, it should be supported in its essence, kind of as a battle. We'll see when it, where it will end up. What, what do you think? Because ageism works both ways. You can be too young for your job or, or too old. So, do you think he has a point that we should be able to change? Um, having traveled a lot through Europe recently, I think that his case will be seen very differently um, depending on, on the country and the legal system. But I do think that especially in Western Europe and in the US, we are seeing more and more attempts to uh, test the limits of individual rights. I think well, come on, is... isn't it a bit ridiculous? I mean, nobody likes getting older, but he should just accept the fact that he's getting older. And but there is, a, you know, there is an actual ageism campaign on October the first. It was a, it's a launched as a global campaign to fight uh, ageism. It, it will run for seventy days, and it will culminate on the International Human Rights Day. So it's being seen as a as going against someone's human right to be discriminated against age. Well, there's reverse ageism as well. I mean, sure. if you look at it around this um, house, you've got MEPs who are quite young and they're often mistaken to be MEP assistants. I mean, they're also discriminated because they're young and they're not taken seriously. Also in jobs as well. I mean, yeah. it's happening. Yeah, yeah, sure. But you, you're basically right. But let's make the same argument about the, the, the uh, sex, about the gender. You are born as a woman. You are not supposed, you are supposed to like it. If you don't like it, you, you cannot do anything about it. Well, we are not accepting it any longer. We are accepting that people can change the gender, sure. can change the sex, can kind of be, be the making it making the transformation. We are accepting. Why why not the age? That's more a human rights issue. Or this is but not. This is a discrimination issue, isn't it? A human rights issue as well. That's the, the point that he was trying to make as well. Yeah, no, I mean, he's making a point and he's grabbing the attention with it and, and really breaking the, yeah. the headlines with it and, and having a good debate about it. And it's good to talk I about mean, it. This but. is the beginning of another debate. You're right. Where, where does it stop? It's a good question. All right. Time for tonight's uh, raw moment. U.S. President Donald Trump has had another run in with the press. Let's take a look. I'm not I'm not responding. I'm responding. <laughs> If it's un Go ahead. Mr. President, no, no, no. Just wait, just wait. if it's unfair to... What are you trying to be him? Sit down. I didn't call you. I didn't call you. Just Give him the mic, please. I've answered the question. Go ahead, take the... Take the... You heard my answer. Go ahead. Well, 
you rudely interrupted him. Are you, That's enough. Put down the mic. That's I not an invasion. Should, honestly, uh, I think you should let me run the country. You run CNN. All right. And if you did it well, your ratings well, let me would be ask, much if better. I, if I may okay, ask one enough. other question. Mr. President, if I may. Are you, that's enough. Put down the mic. Mr. President, are you worried about indictments coming down in this investigation? I'll tell you what. CNN should be ashamed of itself having you working for them. You are a rude, terrible person. You shouldn't be working for CNN. In Jim's defense, I've traveled with him and watched him. He's a diligent reporter who busts. Well, I'm not a big fan of, of yours either. So I yeah, understand. To be honest, so let me, over the course. Okay, of the just sit down, please. I mean, that reporter's uh, press card to the White House actually was revoked. I mean, Trump is not going to change his his uh, stance against journalists, is he? Well, maybe he's not going to change, but that, that doesn't mean that we have to accept it. This is extremely dangerous, it's unpleasant, it's, it's on the verge of being bizarre. You know, mm -hmm. He's pretending to be powerless, he's pretending to, re to represent all, the, all these powerless people in the world, but actually he's one of the most powerful people in the world. Mm -hmm. And kind of this reaction is, is just, it's just unpleasant, extreme, and it's, it should not be tolerated. A very quick reaction from you, Lily? I think the thing to watch right now is the House of Representatives, um, how the dynamics will change now that the Democrats have taken the House, what the committee chairs there will do to serve as a kind of check on the president. And also maybe how he will react, uh, given, given that Absolutely. new pressure. All right. Thank you very much for joining us tonight on Raw Politics. We'd like to hear your views, of course. Tell us what you're talking about. I'm on Twitter at Tessa Celia or at Euronews as well and use the hashtag of Raw Politics. Have a good night.